So um, I'm just going to pray just before I start speaking. Um, so God, yeah, thank you so much for this time that we have together. Holy Spirit, I thank you so much for the people that are here, the people who will watch later on. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would speak to them, Lord. And if there is anyone here who needs encouraging, God, Lord, I just pray that you would um, just show them that you're thinking of them, that you see them and that you are with them. In Jesus name. Amen. Hi, so I'm aware that a lot of you probably don't know me, so I thought I would um, quickly introduce myself. So I'm Joy Hunter, I work for HDB Students, I'm a student pastor. I've been doing it now for almost five years, can you believe it? That's how much I love students, I'm so passionate about you guys. I think it's such an important time in your lives and you have such an opportunity exactly where you are. And so, um, yeah, I'm just passionate about, about students and um, um, I thought I would start off this time by sharing um, a quick embarrassing story about myself because I thought how else can you better get to know me so I remember when I first became a Christian um, I had this moment where I realized that not a lot of people in my life knew that I was a Christian and I wanted to do something to change this and these were the days of MSN which was a long time ago I don't know if you know what MSN is but it was this instant messenger service and I thought what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a bold but um, a small but bold statement and I'm going to change my MSN name to I Love Jesus but the problem with that is that I grew up in Spain and in Spain there are loads of people called Jesus and there's actually a boy called Jesus in my geography class at school who I had completely forgotten about so I went to school the next day didn't really think much of it and my friend she comes running up to me and she's like Joy oh my gosh I saw that you changed your MSN name and I'm like yeah she's excited about my faith this is wonderful and she's like, yeah, I've, I've spoken to him. He's going to come talk to you at break time. And I'm like, oh, no, she thinks I mean Jesus. And it turns out that's what everyone thought. And Jesus did come talk to me at break time. And he told me that he wasn't interested. So rumors went around school that I had been rejected by Jesus, which is kind of the opposite message you would hope to go for as a Christian. <laughs> Stepping out in faith can be really scary, especially when you have no idea what things are going to look like. And often I think it's quite tempting to just want to stay comfortable, to just want to stay in our comfort zones. And when I was a teenager, I felt that God um, was calling me to give more and more to him. And actually, it was just before I became a student, I went to this um, Christian conference and I felt that um, God was calling me to go into ministry. And this was a, a huge faith thing for me, I think, because I come from a background where women didn't really do that kind of thing. I didn't think I had the right personality. I didn't think I had the right voice. I wasn't a 50 year old male. Um, like a lot of people in my life were like, OK, the Christian thing, it's OK, but you might be taking it slightly too far now. And I remember going to this Christian conference and just feeling this call that was so clear. Um, but also so scary and um, God was just calling me to, to lay down everything. Originally I was going to go do art at university and I felt like God was saying no go to Bible college instead and so I came home and I was like God okay I'm going to think about it and I had two weeks where I just prayed and I really wanted to, um, to think it through and I said to God, God if I'm going to do this for you, if I'm going to um, go after this ministry thing then I need you to speak to me really really clearly um, so clearly that I, I can't ignore it and I went to church that Sunday and I was I said God um would you speak to me in this moment and to be honest with you I was really hoping that he wouldn't because then I could get away with um with ignoring it but I went to church and um got through the service God hadn't spoken to me got through the talk didn't feel like God was saying anything and then right at the end when I thought I was in the clear this guy comes up to me and he's like Joy I feel like God's given me a word for you I'm like oh darn it I thought I thought I could leave I thought I was fine and he said I think that God is saying no to some things in your life but I wanted to encourage you that when God says no to something it's always because he's got something better in mind and when we read this passage today they are also in one of these moments it says at the end of the passage so they pulled their boats up to the shore left everything and followed him I just want you to take that in for a minute they left everything their homes their families their jobs their security their comfort what they knew they left everything in pursuit of Christ I wonder what they were feeling in that moment 
let's reverse a little bit. Let's look at what their lives were like before that. They were fishermen by trades. Their families were fishermen. They, they lived this life um, where they would wake up really early. They would go out, they would fish for fish. And I'm sure it, was, it felt very ordinary. It probably felt quite like a safe life. And then this guy called Jesus comes along and he preaches a sermon in their boat, which I'm sure they were, they were fine with. It might've been a bit of an interesting day. I'm sure that was something that didn't happen all the time. And then they were really exhausted in this passage because they had been fishing, but they hadn't caught anything. And this guy called Jesus, this preacher turns to them and says, um, let's fish the other side. And um, Simon gives him a little bit of attitude. I think he's tired. I think he's like, oh, like we've been fishing all night. Nothing's happened. Like, I liked your sermon. I liked, I liked the little Jesus thing that you did. That was good. I liked when you spoke to us, but um, this is actually my trade. This is actually my profession. Um, I actually kind of know what I'm doing here and um, we're tired, but you know, because you said so, we're going to do it just to prove a point. And so they go out and they fish and it says, when they had done so, they caught a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Imagine that their nets were breaking because there was so much fish. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Imagine this boat is beginning to sink. That's how many fish that they had. And when I read that, I felt really challenged because to be honest with you, there's parts in my life where I'm like, okay, God, you can have this, you can have this area, but you know, this, this belongs to me. So for example, Sundays, I'm willing to go to church. I'm willing to hear a sermon, to pray, to, to let God be involved. But you know, on a Monday, when I want to do what I want to do, or, you know, in my dating life, or when I want to go out with my friends, maybe those are parts that belong to me where I should get to do what I want to do. God, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about. But um, here it, it makes me think that if Jesus is Lord, it means that we can't compartmentalize him. If he's Lord, it means he's Lord over everything. He's Lord over Sundays. He's Lord over our studies. He's Lord over what we decide to do with our future. We need to give him control over everything because it is so much safer in his hands than ours. You see, I used to hear sermons like this and I would get discouraged because I would be like, but Lord, I want to hold on to it. It's mine. <laughs> but actually what God has is so much greater. And when God says no to something, when God asks you to do something different to what you originally thought it was going to look like, I promise you, it's always because he's got something better in mind. But God can, um, Jesus can do as much with your life as much as you give him access to. You know, he's not going to force himself. He's not going to force you to do anything you don't want to. But I just think that if Simon had been difficult and decided um, to say no to Jesus, if he decided, you know, this is my boat, this is my profession, you know, no, basically, think of everything he would have missed out on. And um, there is this sermon online that I really love by a guy called Francis Chan. I'm going to try and do an illustration that he does, but I don't know if it's going to work on Zoom, so just, just roll with it. Um, but basically, it's about eternal life, and he does this timeline where um, he shows you how long eternal life is. So this is life after this earth, and then this is the time that we have on this earth. I want you to see how tiny that is. And the thing is, is that a lot of people are living for this little bit here because they don't realize that what they do here affects the rest of this. You know, they're not willing to be a little bit uncomfortable here or say no to a few things here because they don't realize about this eternal perspective. And actually, at the end of my life, I think the worst thing would be is to look back at this time and to think, what could God have done? What could God have done with my life if I had been willing to say yes? God, I submit to you, Lord, I'm willing to be a little bit uncomfortable and maybe say no to some things that to the people around me, it doesn't make sense. To the culture around me, it doesn't make sense. You know, what could God have done with my life if I had said yes? Um, and then at the end of the passage, Jesus encourages them. They repent uh, for their disbelief. And Jesus says, now you will go on to fish for people. And I wanted to encourage you that maybe, I, I don't know your experience at university or, or your lives in general, but maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you've been praying for your friends for a really long time and at university, you're not seeing anything changing. Um, 
I just wanted to encourage you um, that God really wants to do something here. If you will give your, give your next to God, metaphorically, whatever that looks like for you, he wants to help you fish for people. And um, maybe you're like, God, I've been trying for so long. I've been, I've been trying to do this and nothing's happening. Um, I just encourage you, go again, say yes, trust him. Um, you never know what he might do. Just an encouragement. Um, a little bit sad, my granddad passed away a couple of weeks ago and um, I had been praying for him for faith for a really, really long time. And um, there was like a week where he was in the hospital and um, I was going to see him and I, I was praying for him and it just felt like nothing was happening. And uh, my dad had actually been praying for my granddad for 41 years and he passed away and it looked like um, nothing had happened and it was horrible. Um, but then I was organizing the funeral um, and my grandma rang me and said that um, my granddad had actually requested for me to do a sermon at his funeral and specifically that it would be religious. And this was really strange because my granddad isn't a Christian and I always thought he was really against my job. So um, it just baffled me. And then when I rang the vicar to start organizing the funeral, um, he said to me, oh, you know, your granddad had a message for you. Um, actually, the day before he died, I went to go see him and he repented. And he said the biggest regret in his life is that um, he hadn't spent his life with God. And he repented with me in that moment and prayed the sinner's prayer and gave his life to Christ. And my, like when he told me that, I just, I couldn't believe it because I mean, my dad, 41 years of praying, you can imagine. And so just an encouragement that even though it might feel like nothing is happening, sometimes when we're praying for our friends, when we're pushing on doors, it's never too late with God. It's never too late. You never know what he's doing behind the scenes. But I think there's a level of preparation that we need to do. And so I just wanted to say three very, very quick things um, that we need to do in order to prepare for what God has in store for us. Number one, prepare your hearts. It says in the Bible that, um, uh, oh, sorry, no, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, prepare your hearts. I think that it's been a season of discouragement for a lot of people. I think with lockdown and, oh my gosh, I've been feeling it myself. I just want to be with people in person again and not wear these, these masks, be able to smile again. Um, but I just wanted to encourage you, prepare your hearts remember the God that is with you there's a verse in the Bible that says I lift my eyes to the hills where does my help come from my help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth indeed he who watches over in Israel will neither slumber nor sleep the sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night and when you're discouraged I just want to encourage you remember the God that is with you Remember how much he cares about you, so much so that he sent his only son to die on a cross just for you because he cares about you that much. Won't he also give you all things? Um, so if you're feeling discouraged, just remember, remember who is with you. Prepare your hearts. Don't let it get into your heart. Don't get a wilderness mentality. Trust him in the middle. Number two, prepare your vision. Um, I think it's really important to have vision because it says in the Bible, without vision, the people perish. And so if you feel like you haven't got much of a vision for this time, I know that it can feel a little bit like a, like a middle space where we're still on Zoom and we're not in person and it can feel like a wasted time. But I just want to encourage you, ask God for vision for this moment. There is so much that God is doing behind the scenes through things like Alpha and things like this. And oh, there's just so much that God is doing. God is on the move despite everything that we're hearing around us. And so ask God, what is the vision that you have for me? God, what do you want to do through me? Pray into that and, and be obedient to what you feel God is calling you. And finally, prepare your net. Um, sometimes I think there's something really powerful about um, preparing on our nets um, by making room for things that we haven't seen yet. So maybe with the CU, maybe God has all these people that he's about to bring that you don't even know about yet. Start preparing now. Start preparing yourselves now. Start preparing your testimony. Maybe you've never shared how you came to faith before. Think of ways that you can start preparing yourself and praying into that and growing in the space that you're in so that when it comes, when God moves, you're ready for what he's about to do. And that's it. Um, I'm just going to pray for us really quickly and then I'll pass back to Kylie.
Um, yeah, God, thank you that you're moving despite everything that we are seeing around us in the world at the moment. Thank you that there's always hope in you. God, it's never too late. And Lord, if there's anything that we need to lay before you today, Lord, we just choose to do so. God, thank you that our lives are in such better hands with you than they would ever be in our own. And Lord, we just say that we trust you today. We trust you and we say yes to what you want to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the first question for Joy is a very interesting one. It says, how can we fish for people during social distancing? Oh, such a great question. <laughs> I'm asking that question too. Um, I think praying about who God has put in front of us is really important. And I think often God will surprise you with who is on your doorstep. I remember I had this missionary friend who, um, she kept going to Africa and then she felt that God challenged her to um, just go down the road to the people who were there rather than always traveling abroad. And I think sometimes we can have this out there mentality, but actually um, there's a lot of people who are close to us. And so I don't know the people that you're in halls with, um, your family, how they're doing, your friends, just checking in on people really could be a really great way um, to live on them during this time and just show God's heart towards them. And then there's also lots of charities around at the moment, like HTB, for example, sorry for the plug, but we do this thing called Love Your Neighbor, where um, we like deliver food to people who can't afford it. And um, I'm doing this thing at the minute where it's like a, a phone, a friend system. So there's this girl who didn't have anyone and is completely isolated. So I call her once a week just to make sure she's okay and have a bit of input there. So um, there's, lot, there's lots of ways. So yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helped at all. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Joy. And uh, the next question is, what does leaving everything mean for us? Do we still focus on our normal lives? Mm. So I think it can look quite drastic, like in the story. Obviously, the disciples left everything literally to go follow Jesus. I don't believe that God asked everyone to do that. I think for me, it's more about laying down my desires for him of everything. And that doesn't even mean that God will say, oh, they're bad or you need to walk away from them. But it's just knowing that God is your number one priority and that you'll put him first in everything, I think is really what it means. And not putting things above him that can, can slip in. Cool. Thank you. And um, one, we have two more questions. The next one is, why did Simon Peter respond by saying that he is a sinful man in verse eight? This is going back to the passage. I noticed that too. It seems quite dramatic, doesn't it? Um, I don't know. I wonder whether there was a little bit of doubt going on in his heart. And I think um, maybe, I don't know, his, his response to Jesus, it seems like he's a little bit resentful in the fact that, you know, he's been up all, all night or whatever fishing and he's exhausted. And so I wonder whether there was a bit of an attitude in him. And so um, he was repenting of that and was like, oh God, I'm so sorry. You knew what you were doing this whole time. Okay, great. And we have one final question. Um, and this person says, how can we reconcile the different versions of Jesus encountering Simon? For example, in the books of John, Luke and Matthew. And also thank you so, so much for the powerful testimony. Oh, can you say that question again? Sorry, just okay. Going. Um, how can we reconcile the different versions of Jesus encountering Simon, for example, in the books of John, Luke, and Matthew? Mm, what does it, yeah, I want to go deeper in that just to make sure I understand what it's saying. I don't know if the person is happy to elaborate a little bit on the question, if they're, if they're here. Yeah, <laughs> I, I asked a question. Uh, yeah, so it seems to have like three quite different perspectives of how Jesus encountered um, Simon Peter. For example, in John the Gospel, it seems to be Andrew bringing Jesus to him, and then Jesus rename, renaming um, Peter into Cephas, and then he followed. But then in Luke, it seems to be there's an event, there's an incident happen, kind of like directly towards um, Simon Peter, and then he followed Jesus. It seems like the reason of him following seems to be kind of different. 
but yeah. not sure if there's like some conflicts or, or something so yeah mm-hmm. that's a really interesting question you know I've never actually um yeah thought that through really to be honest but I guess what does come to mind is the four gospels are written as you know by different writers and so they're each going to have a different perspective on how things happened and they each tell their version of the, sto- of the story that they saw. And so I wonder whether for the get- different gospel writers, um, there were different things that seemed more important to them, which they were focusing on. It could be that, but it's definitely worth looking into. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Cool. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Thank you so much, Joy, again.